Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics at the University of Oxford. I'm also what's known as the Access Fellow of Jesus College. And today I'm going to answer one of the most commonly asked questions I've received, which is something along the lines of, what do you want? What Oxford University are you looking for in prospective students? It's a difficult question because it's not straightforward. There's quite a lot involved. And we spend a long time on all of the applications, about 20 person hours on average on each application. So we take it really, really seriously. But I think it can be broadly speaking summarized by five C's, which are capability, commitment, critical thinking, creativity, and the least often spoken about, but very important, cooperation. And that one needs a lot of explaining. So you better stick around to the end of the video if you want to know more about that. Anyway, starting off with the most obvious, capability. Our degrees are tough, they're rigorous, we work you quite hard, and so we need to be sure that you're going to enjoy that. You're capable of starting at a pretty high standard already. Now, what capability doesn't mean is perfection. You don't need to have perfect school grades. I'm not even sure that I would know what perfection would look like anyway. So we ask for a certain number of qualifications to be at a particular level, but you don't need to have exceeded that. Whatever it states on our website, and it clearly states what you need, certainly in British qualifications and then in lots and lots of other international qualifications, it's very clear what you need. You don't need more than that. We wouldn't ask you for more than that. So if you've obtained or are going to attain that standard, then you're fine. You have the capability. For some of our degrees, we ask for particular subjects, but for many of our degrees, we don't. And if there are no subjects required at high school or equivalent in your qualifications, then you don't need them. So capability is obviously important, but don't confuse capability with perfection, whatever that means. Another way of gauging your capability is with admissions tests. And many of our degrees use admissions tests and they are a very important predictor of admissions success. So if you have a, an admissions test, make sure you practice that. Check out the videos that we've been putting on the channel that should be able to help you with that. Okay, so capability, pretty obvious, right? For a university like Oxford. So what's next? Next is commitment. Do you actually care about the degree you're applying for? Are you applying for the degree at Oxford because it's Oxford? Or are you applying for the degree because you really love that degree? We're looking for people that more fall into the latter category. In other words, people that are so interested in their chosen degree program that they would love to study it at the highest level. That's what we're looking for. So of course you can have career aspirations. Let's say for example, you want to become a doctor. That's completely fine, totally understandable. But we're also looking for people that can study medicine at Oxford. And studying medicine means doing six years of difficult medical sciences. So are you up for that academic challenge or are you just looking beyond the horizon at when you become a doctor one day? When we read personal statements and other admissions materials, we wanna get a sense that Sure, you have these career aspirations, that's fine, but you're also going to be able to start the degree and enjoy it from day one because you're ready for what the degree will hold. Are you committed, therefore, to the degree? Not committed to the job prospects that you might have afterwards, nor committed to the University of Oxford, because what we care about is not admitting people that are interested in the brand Oxford, but people that are interested in studying their degree. Now, showing commitment can sometimes be hard because in a lot of cases you may be applying for a degree that you've never studied before. So medicine being an example, you can't study medicine at, uh, at school, but you may have studied other subjects similar to it. And one of the best ways of showing your commitment is, is demonstrating that you've done some super curricular reading or experiences that are relevant and that you've spoken about on your personal statement. So that could be reading relevant books or journal articles. Make sure the reading is at the right sort of level. You're trying to convince us that you're ready to be an undergraduate student. So try and read some of the materials that undergraduates would read so that you can convincingly say, I know what it takes to be a medical student at Oxford because I've kind of dabbled in it. I've done some of the stuff that undergraduates do. I've read some of the things that they read, which is now widely available online for free. So try and show your commitment by effectively behaving like an undergraduate student for a few days whilst preparing in particular the personal statement. Again, we've got some videos on that if you need any more help in that regard. Okay, so that's commitment. The third C is critical thinking. Now, this means that you are 
able to think for yourself effectively, that you're not just going to be dogmatic. You're not just going to repeat or regurgitate what some other authority has said. You're going to think for yourself and you're going to be able to determine the strengths and weaknesses of other ideas, other theories, other methods, other data sets. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say in an interview for politics, I ask a question such as, is violence always political? What I'm looking for there is someone that can dive in to the intricacies of that question. What does it mean for something to be violent? What does it mean for something to be political? What does it mean for something to always pertain? Right, someone who's able to critically assess and deconstruct the question and that's not just hunting for some sort of authoritative answer. They're not, for example, going to say, well, the dictionary wouldn't define violence in that way and therefore violence can't always be political. The dictionary is a useful authority, but it's obviously flawed because all such sources are flawed. You know, we, we don't know for certain what the best definition of something as complex as violence can be. So we want to get a sense that you are aware of that, that you're conscious that even these highly august, well-respected sources can be wrong, basically. Okay. Now, being a critical thinker doesn't mean that you have to be a critic. It doesn't mean you have to sort of pour scorn on everything and say, oh, everything's just rubbish. My goodness, if only everyone would just let me tell them how to think. You know, you don't need to be that sort of uh, armchair critic that heckles everyone else. But what you should be able to do is to assess the strengths and weaknesses of anything, because everything has relative strengths and weaknesses. Nothing's perfect. Nothing, as far as we know, is perfect. So you've got to be willing to recognise what's good and what's potentially could be better. That's what critical thinking means. It fundamentally means being an independent thinker and being able to understand where something could be different. Okay. Now, related to this, but somewhat the other side of the coin is creativity. So if a critical thinker is someone that's capable of deconstructing and working out how something could be better, a creative individual reconstructs a solution. So when we interview students, we're looking for people that can deconstruct the question. And it doesn't matter what type of question it is. That could be a mathematics question. It could be a medicine question. It could be a material science question. The question will have certain elements to it that you will be asked to define or clarify. And that's you deconstructing it. That's you being a critical thinker as you try and work out effectively what the question is. Then we'll ask for an answer. So then you've got to reconstruct the question. So if I go back to the example I gave you of, is violence always political? A creative person would be someone that can say an answer to that. Right? And I suppose creativity will typically imply something that is unorthodox, potentially. It's not, it's not been heard of before. We're not looking for someone who is just going to repeat received wisdoms, but someone who's going to dive in, contribute to an ongoing discussion that humanity has been having since there have been human beings. Now, bear in mind, you don't need to be excellent at this. Being creative is incredibly difficult. And when you try and say something new and fresh and original, there's a huge risk that you could say something that is completely indefensible. But that's okay. If you're applying to the university, we're not expecting you to be really, really good at this sort of stuff because why, there'd be no point teaching you, in other words, would there? So what we're looking for is willing, not capability at this stage. Are you willing to create? Are you willing to speak for yourself and stick your neck out and try and say something fresh and original? So with regards to is violence always political, I suppose quite a creative answer would be something a little bit unusual, something along the lines of, yeah, yeah, violence is always political. And then having the capacity to explain why that is. Clearly, I'm not building this off a dictionary definition of what it takes for something to be violent. I'm perhaps utilising my own understanding of what violence means as something that is always inherently to do with power, that if you are acting in a violent way, whether that is physical or emotional violence, you are exerting your power over someone else. You're tacitly saying to them, I deserve to diminish you. I want to diminish your autonomy. And that is inherently a thesis on power. That is someone saying, I have this power, I'm using this power. You don't deserve it. So you could argue, if you take control of the question yourself, and if you're willing to create, you could argue that violence is always political.
and that it, to a certain extent this is a tautology right that the saying violence is political is the same thing as saying politics is violent the two words are practically two sides of the same coin anyway you don't need to have gone that far in analyzing the question you just need to show that willingness to speak for yourself you need to try and be creative because the university of oxford and other similar universities thrive on innovators you can't just sustain a modern university with people all repeating each other for time immemorial. And so we're looking for new creators to come onto our team, okay? So that's the fourth C, creativity. The final C, as I mentioned, is a little bit less often spoken about, but I think is particularly important, and that is cooperation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, okay, so we teach at Oxford in very small classes called tutorials. So my tutorials for politics are never more than three students, and they're usually actually smaller than that still. So I usually have about one or two students in my classes. And what we do in those classes called tutorials is that we discuss a problem in great detail. And we are working together to try and come up with some solutions to this incredibly complicated, very long-standing puzzle that humanity has been grappling with. That is therefore a dialogue, right? It's a conversation and it requires cooperation. It requires someone with an open mind who's not dogmatic, who's willing to listen, but is also willing to contribute. So what I mean by cooperation is not someone who is outgoing, uh, extroverted, very sort of bubbly and friendly. I'm just talking about someone who is able to listen and able to contribute their views. Even if they feel quite shy, they're still willing to say, here's what I think for what it's worth. That is cooperative. Someone is uncooperative if they are closed minded, they're unwilling to listen, they're unwilling to share, and they fundamentally see the, the teaching environment either as completely passive, in other words, they just sit back and do nothing and just absorb information, or completely antagonistic, in other words, they have to win their points. The way we teach at Oxford isn't like that. The way we teach at Oxford is, it's a communal enterprise. We're trying to figure this stuff out together. We probably won't come to concrete answers at the end of the process, but we want to try and help each other out struggle through these difficult problems. So the tutor in that scenario is not going to look down on the student and say, well, I know the answer, so come on, hurry up to my position. They're going to help the student get to that position. Okay, so a bit of cooperation, a bit of open mindedness is important. And this is true of natural sciences and mathematics as well. I know you may be thinking, well, you can't really debate stuff in in mathematics, you're, you're coming to a right answer. And in some aspects of mathematics, that will be true, but there will be a lot of different and creative ways that you can resolve a particular mathematical problem. And again, it'll be about you and the tutors working out together cooperatively how those approaches towards the problem solving can most effectively be achieved. So it's still a highly cooperative venture and mathematics is still taught in incredibly small classes relative to other universities around the world. So what is sometimes called teachability at Oxford is an important part of the admissions process and it's gauged primarily at interview. Will this person basically get the most out of our tiny classes, our tutorials? Will they be willing to open up their mind, open up their ears and open up their mouth? <laughs> and get stuck into the conversation or will they perhaps be better suited by a different teaching style that's something else that we're looking for so those broadly speaking are the five things we are looking for we're looking for someone who's capable which i suppose is fairly obvious but capability doesn't mean perfection we're also looking for someone who's committed are you sure that you want to study the degree and you're not just applying to oxford because it's oxford we want people that want to do the degree that's the most important thing are you a critical thinker? Are you capable of deconstructing a puzzle and realizing where strengths and weaknesses may lie in someone else's approach to the same puzzle? Are you creative? Once you've deconstructed something, can you build something back up again? Can you help us resolve some of these puzzles? And finally, are you cooperative? Are you going to help us out in this journey of exploration, of trying to work out the vast and intricate mysteries of the universe? Or are you just waiting for someone to give you the answers? Or are you going to try and fight with people over what those answers may be? Those are the things that we look for and we gauge them in a four month admissions process from submitting applications in October to admissions tests in November 
to interviews in December to decisions in January. It's a very rigorous and careful process and that, broadly speaking, is what we're looking for. So I hope that makes sense. If you've got any questions or comments, do for goodness sake put them in the comment box and I'll answer them as soon as possible. Thank you so much for watching. All the best to you. Bye.